bonus content. There we go. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 105 of the Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Ruben Lerner. Hello. Curtis McHale. Good day. Eric Davis. Hey. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. We also have a couple of special guests. We have Anthony Eden. Bonjour à tous. And Brian Helmkamp. Hello. So we brought you guys on today because you both have successful SaaS businesses and I know several freelancers that, you know, they, they kind of dream of starting a, a business on the side. And with the particular skill sets that we in general on the show have, it's usually some SaaS product that, you know, serves a particular market, particular purpose. And so I, I thought uh, we'd give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves and then we'd, we'd talk about that and how to get started and things like that. Sounds good. Anthony, do you want to introduce yourself first? Absolutely. So I'm Anthony Eden. I am one of the founders of DN Simple. Uh, I am located in France right now, but originally from the U.S. Uh, I was a freelancer for the beginning when we first started DN Simple and then also worked as a full-time employee for a company while continuing to develop DN Simple. So I kind of have both aspects of that that uh, were part of the development of DN Simple that, uh, that helped sort of shape how I approach it, as well as past experiences developing uh, startups for various people. Awesome. What about you, Brian? Hi. Uh, yeah, sure. So I am one of the co-founders of Code Climate. Uh, we're based out of New York, and we've got about four full-time people these days. My background is in software engineering. Uh, I started Code Climate while I was the CTO of a previous startup. Uh, and then I did a bit of freelancing in the time between when uh, I left that job and then started working full time uh, on Code Climate. So I have a little bit of experience in terms of bridging that gap and doing both at the same time. And I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. So one thing that I'm really interested in is is your you know how you got things started. Uh, do you guys want to just talk about how you uh, made the deci- decision and made the transition into running a SaaS product or project or whatever? Sure. You- I. I can go first if you'd like on that. Okay. Uh, so at the time when I started DN Simple, I was just finishing up a startup that was sort of, it was kind of stagnating. We figured it wasn't going anywhere. I was out in Hawaii at the time, living out there, and a couple of us had started taking freelance gigs. And I, I said, you know, I've been doing software development for other people for a long time, and I know the the DNS and domain industry pretty well. I said, I said to myself, you know, it's about time that I start building something. So I spoke with my brother and said, hey, you want to work on something together? And we agreed to build DN Simple. And, and that was kind of the genesis of it. We we looked around. We, at the time, I had, I think, a domain or two on GoDaddy. And, and every time I went in, I just wanted to just punch myself in the face repeatedly to stop the pain. And I said, you know, there is a, a big opportunity here. And uh, so that was sort of the genesis of it. And then we took three years to build it up. And during that time, like I said, just did uh, did other things until I was able to go full time on it. What about you, Brian? So when I started Code Climate, uh, I was the CTO of a startup um, that was actually doing uh, pretty well at the time. But I had always really been interested in developer tools. Uh, I've done a lot of open source software. So I couldn't shake the feeling that, you know, it would be really interesting to figure out if I could work on tools for other developers to use and be able to make a living off of that. So I started poking around at different ideas in that space, uh, had uh, maybe one small kind of like false start, um, and then settled on the idea that became Code Climate. Uh, did a lot of research uh, around the product idea before writing codes in terms of like interviewing other developers, doing mock-ups, getting feedback and surveys, that kind of stuff. And at the time, it was just me, actually. Uh, so uh, I have a co-founder now. He joined maybe a little ar- around a year after we were up and running, still very small at the time. But I do have a little bit of kind of both of the experience of doing something um, solo as well as doing it with a partner, which I'm very happy to have now. And so I actually took two days off of work to launch Code Climate from my day job. I just put in for a couple days of vacation and use that as the opportunity to start accepting public signups. And then we've been kind of rolling forward from there. We started charging on day one. So it was always a matter of looking at the 
um, you know, the data in terms of whether people seem to be buying it and happy with it. That was the driver for figuring out, should I spend more time on this or should I change it or should I just scrap it? And over time, it gave me enough confidence to be able to quit my full-time CTO job and then move on to Code Climate as my primary thing. Awesome. That's really cool. So it took two days to build Code Climate? I guess not to the point it is now, but... No, two days to launch it. Uh, many more days than that uh, at night to build it uh, on the side. And then it got to the point where it's like, okay, this thing's almost ready to go, but I really need some extra time to push it over the edge. And I want to be available when I launch it in case anything goes wrong and also to respond to people's questions and that kind of thing. So it was the launch uh, I took two days for and then built it on the side before that. Hey, Brian, how long was it then that you it went from inception to launch? It's a good question. I would say about three or four months for that very early product that we launched, which was, you know, looking back at it now, it is cringeworthy um, for us. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I can't believe that anybody would find it, you know, usable or, or anything like that. But I felt like I needed to launch something as soon as possible to be able to continue to justify spending time on it. So I think it was about three or four months of just on the side nights and weekends kind of thing. Yeah, our story is pretty much the same. The first product uh, was started in April 2010, and we launched in ju- July, so it took around four months. And uh, the goal was to launch it at RailsConf in 2010, and we ended up having to delay to just after RailsConf, which is typically what happens. You plan to launch something, and, and you're getting all these little last details done, and you just miss this, those launches are hard because there's all these little things you want to clean up, but at some point you just got to push it out there. And, and I think that's one of the key things that if you're going to do a service... You just got to do something at some point. At some point, you got to stop playing around and you got to say, okay, I'm going to launch something. And charge for it. Mm -hmm. And charge for it. Yeah, we also charge from day one as well, which is, I think is the only reasonable thing to do if you respect your customers. So I I guess the question is, it sounds like you guys talked to customers and worked on the product simultaneously. What kinds of things are you looking for in feedback from customers? What I was doing at the time, um, actually, I was using, it's funny you should mention conferences, I was using conferences as a um, way to do some uh, testing of the concept. So when I found myself at conferences around other developers, that was kind of the most high value time for me to just, you know, people aren't really fully booked up during that time. They kind of have some downtime. So I could just grab people in the hallway and say, hey, you know, can I buy you a beer at the hotel bar, spend 15 minutes uh, getting your thoughts on some stuff. And, you know, what you're really looking for is something that resonates with them without you having to really sell it to them, right? You want something where they're kind of pulling you through the conversation because it would be really valuable to them rather than you kind of pulling them, you know, leading the horse to to water and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, you had this thing that did that? Like, yeah, that would be interesting. Like, that, they're not going to buy um, anything like that. So, you know, one of the sayings is if somebody tells you that they're not going to buy it, they're not going to buy it. Uh, if somebody tells you that they will buy it, they may buy it, but probably not. (laughs) Uh, so you really want something that they're, you know, kind of makes them light up in terms of, yes, we have that problem. And this seems like it would be a solution for that. But, you know, early on, you're focused, focusing much more on the problem than the solution. Right. So for us, the problem was that even experienced teams with good intentions often run into maintainability issues with their software over the long term. And what we heard from a lot of developers who had been on projects that were, you know, up and in including like a year uh, and longer running was that they had these issues. They all identified with that. So that gave us some sense that, well, if there's something we can do that helps with that, then we can probably find a way to make money on it. But I think it was important to be more attached to the problem space than the solution, because a lot of if you're too attached to the solution, you end up trying to invent a problem that it solves, and that's the the wrong way to do it. Brian, in your case, and I guess also, also yours, Anthony, both of you decided to start businesses that had to do with technology problems. So these were problems that you personally had experienced issues with and that you were familiar with uh, the marketplace and and what customers are like. Did you still, despite that, or in addition to that, go out and talk to people, try to find out what where their pain points were before launching? Honestly, we didn't. So when we said we were going to, our initial launch was for the DNS product only. 
And uh, it was just something that we said, okay, we can do this and start with something and let's see how it goes. And the launch was kind of, it was okay. We launched to uh, some people, basically to people that were people that we knew that were friends and so on and so forth. What really happened was afterwards, we started saying, well, what happens if we sell domains and talk to some of our existing customers as well as other people on Twitter? And we said, you know, would you guys like it if we sold domains at this price? And the response was pretty overwhelming. It was just like, yes, please do it. You know, get us out of whatever we're in right now. So that was the, that sort of pushed us along. So we talked to customers. Now we, I never intended DN Simple to be a product for non-tech people in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the audience has always been developers because that's how, that's who I know. That's the people I can sell to. That's who I can talk to. Whether that means that we're limiting our audience, it probably does, but I'm okay with that because I'm okay with having an audience that's sort of primed and ready for the product that we're offering as opposed to a general audience that doesn't even know what they want out of the product. So for us, it was it was a pretty easy decision to just stick with developers and talk to developers directly through conferences, through Twitter, uh, and then directly via email and things like that. Yeah, and I, I think for us, it was pretty similar. Um, there are a lot of people now uh, who have ended up using Code Climate who are not really developers. They might be people like project managers or you know non technical managers, and we think it's great that they're able to get a lot of value out of the tool, but. From day one, we've always said that, you know, our product is by developers for developers. And so that's where our focus is and the extra, you know, that's just uh, an addition that's um, been a happy coincidence. And if you believe that developers are sort of leading the way, and I, I, I truly believe that software developers are going to define a lot of how we do business in the future. So it seems like a, a pretty good audience to sell to because, you know, computers are at the core of so much of what we do now, and the people that control them and know how to tell them what to do have a distinct advantage. So why not make them your customers and your advocates, as far as I'm concerned? Yeah, I generally agree with that. I think um, one thing to be aware of is that, in our experience, developers tend to have a much smaller amount of buying power than people in, say, sales and marketing type roles. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, every business... If you ask them what their biggest problem is, I think if you ask Anthony and I what our biggest problem is, it's, it's probably, um, you know, growing the business, finding more customers is always going to be towards the top of that list. So if you have a product where you can go to people and say, well, this will help you find more customers, there is a kind of built in budget for that. Whereas if you have a product where you're going to developers or operations people and you say, well, this is going to help you do, um, technology or operations better. There are definitely tons of sales that get made there, but the average price point for those sales, um, I think, in general, is is considerably lower than sales and market uh, selling into like sales and marketing functions, for example. So, if I do a SaaS product of some sort that's aimed at developers, I might know the market, and there might be a lot of people out there, but I'm not going to be able to charge necessarily you know two hundred, five hundred dollars a month, which is what some of these SaaS products can do, I guess. Well, so we, I mean, we do have plans that are two hundred dollars a month and four hundred dollars a month, and we have a number of customers uh, on both of those. But you know, there are as a contrast point, for example, you know, we use a CRM system in order to stay in touch with our customers, and it helps us do things like keep notes uh, about our conversations with them. Um, we actually it has a click to call function, so if we're going to call somebody, we can do it right from inside this app. And they charge on the order of, I think, about $60 per person per month. So if you have 10 people who use this app, it's $600 a month. If you have 20 people who use the app, it's $1,200 per month. And just goes up and up and up from there. And so you can definitely do, in in my opinion, uh, depending on what you're selling, you can definitely sell products into technology portions of a business at hundreds of dollars a month, even $1,000 a month. Um, New Relic has a very strong business at a pretty high price point, for example. But so that's really nice. But in, in comparison to the size of contracts that you can get for things like CRM software, it's you know a one or two steps down from that. Yeah, keep in mind though that there are trade offs for when you're selling to the higher price point. Then you have these higher friction sales channels that you have to go through, which introduce a whole different set of problems. And so um, the other thing you have to deal with also is the market. You know, I mean, the the market that we're in has a very specific price point that people are comfortable paying. And and the gap between what's at the bottom and what's at the top is huge. 
But the group at the top is, they have dedicated sales teams. They have to because they're selling to businesses where they're charging thousands and thousands of dollars a month or a year for their service. And with that, you have to have, assume a sales cycle that's going to probably be six months to a year to get a, you know, to get a sign off on that. And, you know, yep. there's good sides to each types of models and you kind of just have to decide what you want as your business owner, as the business owner. What do you want to get out of it? Where do you want to focus your energy? Uh, what kind of market do you want to sell into? And, and there's nothing that says you can't eventually cross over from one into the other. And that may be the right approach. Maybe you start off initially uh, at the low end and then you, you move your way up market. Or maybe you start off up market, get a few big customers, and then slowly work your way down market. You know, there's a lot of different approaches. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And you know, you've seen companies like GitHub when they started, they didn't have anything with enterprise, and they've now they have this whole uh, line of the business GitHub Enterprise, much um, higher price point, much larger sales, much longer sales cycle. I think Anthony, what you said about how the price point affects the business is spot on. I mean, one thing that I think about regularly and talk about with people who are thinking of starting a business is you can almost everything kind of falls from your price point. So if you have a price point of, you know, $1,000 a month and up, that is going to basically dictate not only how long your sales cycle is and which companies you're selling to, it's going to dictate things like what is the ratio between salespeople to developers in your company? Whereas if you have a price point of, you know, $10 a month, then you pretty much can't afford salespeople no matter what. The economics of that just don't work. So you're going to have probably effectively zero salespeople. And so it's a huge question in terms of like what type of organization you want to run. And that is almost defined economically by that price point because when you put the numbers on the back of an envelope, there's only certain structures that work at certain price points. Is there a good way to determine which one fits best for you? Well, so I would start with whatever you're most comfortable with. So if you are somebody who is comfortable selling and your maybe your background is in, you know, sometimes I joke that there's really only two jobs in a startup that you're either building shit or you're selling shit. And <laughs> if your background is in selling, then you may want to, you know, focus on a business where you can have those interactions like high touch, high inter value interactions with customers um, on an ongoing basis. I mean, everyone has to do that at the beginning. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, you're giving away the thing away for free. You're going to have to spend a lot of time talking to your customers. But as your business scales up, there's a question of whether you can, um, whether the, you know, economically it makes sense to do that. So if you are, you know, come from the selling side, then you might want to do something that involves a little bit more selling. If you come from the building side, like I did, uh, and like, uh, Anthony did, then you're going to probably find a more natural fit with something where the price point's a little bit lower and you're spending a little bit less time at scale talking to every customer. Yeah, and it's also going to be, dict again, it's going to be set somewhat by what the existing market looks like. So your whether your product is something that is relatively new. So Code Climate, in a lot of ways, is, is was kind of new in a sense in that it was a, you know, a developer-oriented service that targets the quality of code that's done as a SaaS as opposed to a tool that you get either open source that you buy that you install locally. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of a unique model or, or was when it was launched in a lot of ways. Take that and compare it to the domain and DNS industry. It's been around for 20 years and, and hasn't changed that much. So the market, like trying to sell into that market in a different fashion is very challenging. We found a lot, a lot of friction initially just trying to get people to sell us to, to buy our DNS service. So we, to, to agree that DNS is a product in itself that has enough value that they're willing to pay for it. So you're also influenced somewhat by the existing markets, assuming it, that there is one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think uh, part of what the advice that I was uh, giving was, if, you know, if someone's looking at like, they're not sure what market they're going into yet, definitely researching the market and figuring out how it's sold currently is will be a big factor in figuring out you know what your business will look like if you are successful in that market. Yeah. So one other thing that I, I run into, and you kind of said you're either building stuff or you're selling stuff. Uh, the selling stuff is kind of hard sometimes. I mean, how do you get those initial customers? And then how do you get them to tell their friends? Well, in our case, I went to the audience that I knew. So uh, there's essentially you, the salesperson it, it can either try to do a cold sale, right? So that means calling up somebody that they don't know that they, they may have get a little bit of information about, but trying to, to sell them 
Basically, that's the ability of the salesperson to sell the product. If, on the other hand, you're selling to a community that you're already comfortable with, which I think was both my case and Brian's case, we're not selling something that they've never heard, that they don't know anything about. We're selling something that we've already basically launched, that the product's out there and they have some knowledge of it. So we're not just trying to pitch them from a, a, a cold call sort of perspective. We're actually, there are people we know. We have a bond with them in some way. And we're basically saying, Hey, look, I've built this. You should try it out. And, you know, it's going to, it's going to be awesome for you. Obviously, you have to have a good product if you're going to sell that way. Uh, and a good product is a, is a good thing to have no matter what. There are people that can sell crappy products, but it's a lot easier to sell something that's great. Getting their friends to talk about it. That's a matter of, again, building a great product. And I think one of the things that I'm learning now more than ever is that the way you get people to, to talk about your product, in addition to having a great product, is just to ask them. I mean, it's so hard for us to ask people to talk about it, but if you give somebody a great experience, just say to them, hey, if you could tell your friends about us, that would be awesome. So I guess the other question that I have, well, I have two more that, that are just kind of pressing for me. And one is, how much balance do you give to building your product versus talking to your customers and finding out what they need. Because sometimes it's kind of hard to find people or you've, you've kind of tapped out the folks that you've talked to for a while. And so you do have that opportunity to work on the product, but you might be working on the wrong thing. And the way that that's worked out for us historically is it tends to come in phases. So we started and at the time, you know, we didn't have any idea what we were going to build. So we spent a lot of time talking to people. Once that uh, those discussions seem to coalesce, and we started hearing the same things over and over again by changing the questions that we were asking and forming some hypotheses about what we thought was going to be useful to people. We got to the point where we said, okay, we think we understand this pretty well. Let's spend some time building something, and then we'll go back to our customers uh, or potential customers and get their feedback on that. And, you know, at the beginning, those loops for us were quite small. Uh, you know, we would do something as simple as like, design a single email. And I would, you know, I went up to a number of people at conferences and said, well, what if I could just send you an email report that looked like this every week? Like there was no website, you couldn't click on anything. It was just this email. Um, and what would, you know, how uh, would that affect you? And then as we've gotten a little bit bigger, our cycles are probably a little bit longer now, but we still definitely have periods where we go out and we say, okay, we just really need to be heads down and deliver these features that it sounds like we're, you know, we're confident are going to be valuable to our customers. And then when that's done, we're going to spend a bunch more time figuring out what we need to be focused on next. Yeah, in our case, I think I'm with Brian on this. I think it's cyclic. I think that you start by asking questions and then you build something, the something small. And then you launch that and then you start asking more questions and then you iterate and you basically continue that cycle indefinitely. And that's building a business. You know, it's basically just iteration after iteration of product. Then the, the follow on questions, what needs to be added to the product? What needs to be removed to the product? How do you sell the product in a way that's different? There, there may be times where you have small iterations. There may be times where you have significant changes because you realize that you're, you're miss, you, you've learned something along the way that requires a, a big change. But you got to do both. You got to be out there talking to people at conferences, at local events, through different channels, depending on where your audience is, through Twitter, through uh, through communities. Like if you're a developer, stack you know in one of the Stack Overflows or Stack Exchange, getting on there and not pitching your product, but helping people around the concepts of your product is a great way to sort of get out there and meet new people might be interested in your product. And you do have to be doing that on a regular basis, especially in the early phases of the business. I'm sort of curious to know, uh, how long did it take you guys to reach the point where this could be the full-time thing you did for your primary income? It took about three years. And part of that's because I decided that I, uh, well, I mean, I have a family. I've got kids. I've got a wife. I've, I have a mortgage. I have all the things that the trappings of, I guess you could say middle America, but middle world at this point, if you're, if you're in a first world country. And all of these trappings come along with the bills that go with them. And so I said, you know, I'm not going to put everyone in my family through this huge pain. I'm going to take on as much as I can. And so the company just sort of grew from day one. It took three years to get to the point where I could say, all right, I'm done with my other day job. I'm done with any other sort of consulting. I'm going to focus solely on this product, and it's going to pay me well enough that I don't have to worry about my finances. 
And I actually wasn't the first one that came on full time. Uh, my brother and uh, our other partner who joined, who we acquired his company in 2012, they were both full time before I even joined. I just pulled up the date of the first commit into the Code Climate repository. And it was uh, basically almost two years on the dot between that first commit and when I was able to take enough salary, not nearly as much salary as I had when I was a CTO, but um, enough salary to be able to pay my rent. So, you know, one of the things about subscription businesses is there is a double-edged sword. Uh, and one side of that sword is that once your subscription business is up and running and you have lots and lots of subscribers, it is very stable and predictable uh, and you can, you know, grow it in terms of, by you know, it can compound on itself, uh, especially if you have good things like word of mouth going on. But the other side of that same sort is it just takes forever to get started. So, you know, sometimes if I occasionally hear somebody talking about how they're looking at launching a SaaS business and they're hoping that it'll pay their bills in, uh, you know, within a few months, like, uh, I don't know anyone personally who has been able to do it that quickly. It's just a very long slog to build up those subscriptions from nothing. Agree 100%. I don't know anybody who's done that. Essentially, if you want a paycheck from day one, you're probably going to have to take funding. And then most most investors don't really want you paying yourself that much anyways. They want you putting everything back in the company, building up a team and things like that. It's just, if you're building a, a, a subscription product, it takes time. That's what it comes down to. So in some ways, it almost sounds ideal to do it on the side while you're freelancing because you can build it up over time. You can say, okay, it's going to take a year, two years, three years until this can be the my primary income. Freelancing or with a company that you have an agreement where they are okay with you building on the side. Either one of those cases, I think, I think is the optimal way to do it. The trick, though, is you, you have to still commit to building that thing because it's really easy to spend all your time doing the freelancing work, for example, and then not spending enough time on developing and building the business that you actually want to have sustain your company or to s sustain your life. So you still have to be driven. Uh, you can't get away from that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I would emphasize that it is very, uh, well, it might be an economic necessity to split time between a job or freelance while building up a subscription business. If you're not, you know, you don't have the, the funds to, to not be working for an extended period of time. Uh, it is really challenging. Like I had a freelancing engagement between my full-time job and working on Code Climate full-time. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, 20 hours a week, and that was about what I was working. But it felt like, you know, when you added in the time it took to wake up in the morning, you know, uh, walk to the office, get settled in, you know, work a full day or half a day or whatever it was, and then, you know, leave, come back home. You know, I felt like I had spent... 70% of my energy on this, uh, you know, in terms of like available energy to get work done on a job that was supposed to be 20 hours a week. So in theory, like half time. So it was very hard. Uh, one of the things that I would definitely recommend if there's any way that you can possibly do it would be to save up some money so that you can have a period of time where you are working full time on the business before the business is paying you. And that I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to do that. So there was a point when I was freelancing where I was able to look at the numbers for the business, project forward a bit and say, okay, this is working. I'm going to cut off all the freelance. I'm going to spend 100% of my time on Code Climate. It's not going to pay me a dollar for at least three months, but I can cut my spending back quite a bit and live on a shoestring budget for that time. And then at that point, I'll be better off for it. And I think when your business is at a key time like that, being able to just work on it, at least for, you know, two, three months is a really big deal. That makes a lot of sense. One thing that you guys both mentioned was that uh, you said, I'm the co-founder of my company. And this is really kind of close to the vest. I had a partnership worked out with somebody and I broke it off yesterday for a SaaS product. And the reason was that basically, and, and he, he kind of spelled it out too, was that the way he said it was that I didn't value what he brought to the table. And essentially, I yeah, I didn't see that what he brought was worth 50% of the business. So when you're co-founding or 
setting up a partnership, what recommendations do you have uh, regarding that? Like, who should you find and what kind of arrangement should you pick up? So when you're picking a partner for a business, it is very much like picking a spouse. You are going to spend more time with this person. Uh, if your business is successful, then you probably will with your spouse. My co-founder knows more about me than uh, I think my parents do at this point easily, and I trust him completely. We had worked together at two previous jobs, totaling probably around three years, and, and we're personal friends outside of work as well. And the reason, you know, I think I mentioned that I was solo on Code Climate for a little bit over a year before he came on is that uh, I never intended to run Code Climate as a solo business. Uh, and it, that was pretty awful in many respects. However, I was very uncompromising in terms of who I would work with as a business partner. So I had a small set of people who I kind of knew in my network where I had flagged them as like, if this person, you know, wanted to do it, I would really consider that. But I wasn't out there like trying to, you know, meet somebody who was interested in doing it because I just didn't feel like there would be any, that, that there would be a high chance of success if our relationship was just starting at that point. So as it turned out, a lot of the people that I, um, you know, the, the few people that I knew who I would consider for that sort of thing um, were not available at the time. They had good things going on at other companies and the timing just didn't quite work. So I said, okay, I'm just going to do this solo for the moment and keep reevaluating this. And then eventually, um, it became the case that my co-founder Noah did have some availability and we, you know, it was pretty soon after that, that he was kind of full time, you know, working as a co-founder and not, you know, full time, not getting paid at all, um, which is kind of my best definition when people ask me like, what's, you know, what's a co-founder? It's somebody who's working full time and not getting paid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's been good. Um, we've been fortunate, uh, in, in that regard. You know, I definitely have friends who have had people that they've known that they've gone into business with. And there's been, you know, just like marriages, there are issues that come up. And then, you know, people deal with that in different ways. Yeah. I think no matter what you do, that you're going to, there's always the chance that things are going to, to sour in any partnership. So, there's just nothing you can really do to stop that from happening. You can definitely try to mitigate it by one, working with people that you already have sort of a trust relationship with. I think the, the, what Brian pointed out about having worked with somebody previously on multiple jobs is, is a, a good starting point, but ultimately you have to be prepared. I think it helps a lot to have as much in writing early on as you can that sort of sets the boundaries and sets the expectations. In almost every case where you're going to have issues, it's because you didn't communicate it up front and it wasn't clear what everyone's expectations were. And then when you hit those problems, you, you, if you look back on it, you start to go, you know, we didn't really spell this out and that's why it caused a problem. So I think preparation and ongoing communication is the only way to try to mitigate that. You're still going to run into cases where it just doesn't work out. And so depending on where you are in the business, there's a lot of ways that you can deal with that, but uh, you have to kind of be prepared for it to happen at some point. So did you bring your co-founders in because they had certain skills that you lacked or because you thought that they would be in some other way a good asset to bring into the business? But in our case, it was because I w knew that I was going to be, I could develop software, but I didn't, we, I knew that operations, the system operations, because it's going to be a big p part of our success. Our ability to to keep the systems operating 24-7 with as little downtime as possible when it comes to DNS is a big piece of what we have to do. And so that sort of pushed my decision when I decided to, to ask my brother to work with me. It was like, hey, I need somebody who really understands how to operate systems, and he was the right person to do it. For me, um, my co-founder uh, has a relatively similar background in terms of coming from the engineering side. So we weren't one of those you know, kind of partnership arrangements that you see sometimes where you might have one person more on the technical side, one person more on the you know, business selling side of things. Um, it wasn't really that. But I knew that it was incredibly valuable to have somebody else who had the business kind of internalized and could bring their, you know, ideas and critical thinking to bear on the problems that we were facing that wasn't just me. And I also knew that my co-founder is very good at, you know, solving problems and thinking about things in a very 
clear and measured way. So we have a similar background, but we have different kind of styles. Um, and I think they complement each other really well. So, you know, I knew that the business was going to be better off if there was a blend of those different styles managing it and not just me. Very cool. So uh, one other question I have then is now that your businesses are somewhat established, what strategies do you use in order to grow your customer base? So we use a lot of different strategies. The first and foremost is that we we continue to try to build an amazing product, provide just superior support, and really care about our customers' needs. And that, in turn, gets our customers to to basically be our biggest advocates. What we want is we want our customers who are, are constantly amazed by how we do things and therefore go out and tell other people, man, you guys got to use this. Because the power of a recommendation is, it, it can't really be matched by any other sort of advertising. Now, for sure, we also do other forms such as we, we do a lot of content. So we, we publish various posts. We try to do educational materials. We work on a support site that includes materials about uh, what we do and how it gets done. I launched a drip course, an email drip course for the basics of DNS, things like that. All those are, are good things to do as well. And on top of that, we, we often uh, have sponsored conferences, especially ones where we can put somebody on the ground at the conference who can just go out and talk to people. So those are the kinds of techniques that we use right now. Yeah, I, I think for us, it's very similar. You know, the backbone of our customer acquisition is our product. And that's definitely reflected in, you know, the way our organization is built up. We've got three people with engineering backgrounds. We've got a user experience and, and user interface designer. Um, so together, a lot of our energy is um, invested in the product. Uh, we do, you know, content marketing uh, like Anthony does, uh, as well as kind of community relations type stuff, being at conferences um, where it makes sense and speaking at conferences uh, from time to time. Um, and we, you know, we're starting to play around a little bit with some online um, marketing as well, but it's very small compared to the first things uh, that I mentioned. Cool. Both of you guys, I think, at some point, uh, well, I guess, Brian, you were the CTO of a company, but I think both of you at various points were doing freelancing before and during while you were working on your SaaS products. I'm sort of curious to know if you miss the variety, because one of the things that I love about my consulting and freelancing work is that I'm constantly meeting new people and new problems. And while I love the idea of doing a product, I keep thinking, yeah, but focus on only one thing? That seems so hard and even boring. So I'm wondering <laughs> what you guys think about that. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. It's funny you should say that about like, you know, focusing on one problem because as soon as you step into running a business, especially if you have other people or employees that you're working on with it, you have a huge array of many different problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for sure. And you have to talk to new people all the time because you've got, you know, uh, whether it's prospective customers, existing customers, potential employees that you're recruiting, um, your staff, vendors, and there's always, uh, you know, problem solving that is being, you know, that you have to engage in around all of those things all the time. So, you know, I think it depends on, uh, it's certainly a lot of variety. I mean, I know more about, uh, a lot more about things like marketing, sales, accounting, legal, ops, all of these different facets of the business now than I did when I started because, I had no choice. Like you have to kind of learn it or you die. But uh, in terms of the difference between like I've done consulting in the past where we, you know, we had a new project every few months. It's the, the biggest difference to me, I think, is between how narrow or broad your problem space is. Right. So usually with consulting or freelancing, in my experience, you're kind of, you know, you're doing engineering or you're doing design um, or something else like that for a bunch of different clients. Whereas if you are considering starting a business, if you want to program, you know, I would almost go so far as to say, if you're a programmer and you're thinking of starting a software business, you should not do that if you want to program the majority of your time. And I, I would be interested in Anthony's take, but I would not recommend that. If you want to program the majority of your time, you should join a business, not start a business. Um, you can join an early stage one and there can be a lot of variety there, but if you start it, you're going to have some very significant um, restrictions that are going to be kind of forced on you in terms of the way that you manage your time, whether you like it or not. So it's really about, do you want to do 
one, do you want to focus more on one area and be, you know, the best user interface designer that you can possibly be? Or do you want to be an entrepreneur and, you know, yes, maybe you have a background in design or software and that's a means to an end, but you're going to be doing a whole lot of different stuff, whether you like it or not. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that I spend less time programming now as a business owner than I would if I was a developer for a company. Having said that, the neat thing that I like is as a business owner, I like to think in terms of how can I use computers to help me do a better job at all those other aspects of business. So you're going to end up doing all these different things, but you can use your skills as a programmer, as a developer, to automate a lot of those things. And there's actually a lot of really interesting problems. Uh, now, whether you're a hardcore believing that you should spend all of your time focusing just on your product or not it may change whether or not that's something that you want to do. As your company grows, though, you'll find that you'll start to hire people that are going to focus on the product part of your product. And therefore, you go off and do other things. And again, you can you can reach back into being a developer as a skill that can actually make your life as a business owner even better and more fulfilling. And, and I'm totally with Brian in that the amount of problems that you'll see as a business owner are out, outside of programming. You're going to experience everything. You there, there, at some point you're going to be you're going to have to play lawyer. You're going to have to play accountant. You're going to have to play matchmaker. You're going to have to play friend. You're going to have to play devil. It doesn't matter. You're going to have all these roles that you have to play as a business owner. And I think as a developer, if you know that you're okay trying to do that, then you're okay to start thinking about developing a, a business. If you really just want to focus on working with computers all the time and building systems then I agree, you're probably not quite ready to build a business. You should instead join one where you can have a significant impact on how that business grows. A small business or a small you know, bootstrap startup is a great way to do that. There's nothing that says that you have to go do your own bootstrap from day one. You can go and join somebody else's bootstrap as employee number one. You know? Yeah, and, and to really drive that home, I would strongly recommend that anybody who's thinking about starting a business as almost a prerequisite, work for a early stage startup or a bootstrap company talking about like certainly fewer than 10 people as a way to get experience before that. For me, that was a huge part of why I was able to kind of survive doing Code Climate is I had, you know, worked at small startups before where I didn't necessarily get pulled into all the other areas of the business, but I was sitting in the same room with people who were doing all these, you know, aspects of the business and it rubs off and it certainly helps you have a network of people to draw on. You know, I remember the first time we sold at Code Climate um, a license, like a, a, a large license for our software. And I, I mean, at that point, I didn't even really know what a purchase order was. So I called up the guy who did sales at uh, the pr a previous company I worked at and said, hey, hey, man, uh, I think there's, I don't know, are they sending me a purchase order? Or do I send them a purchase order? Like, how does this work? They, they, they bought it, but I don't actually know, like, how they're going to pay for it. Can you <laughs> fill me in on how that works? And that was because of a connection that I had from a previous company. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally 100% with that. You, you got, if you can, before you start any sort of a business, I, I firmly believe one, go work for a, an early stage company. And that's, that's be one of the first few people in there. Two, go work for a big company. Go understand what it's like to work for a company that has, you know, 2,000 employees, 10,000 employees, because those two ends of the spectrum are so different that it takes a different sort of understanding to sort of live in those environments. And the other thing that's the nice benefit of after you work for a big company, you realize how much you never want to do that again. And Absolutely. so it's, it's a good <laughs> incentive. It, it teaches you. So yeah, do that. Absolutely. Oh my God. My, my first job, both during college and then after college, was at HP. And, um, you know, it was a great company. I learned a lot. But I'm so glad to be done with the bureaucracy of large companies. And it's a great feeling when I go to a client that's a big company and then I leave there at the end of the day. I think, ha, I was here for one day and they have to stay here forever. Yeah, one of my best experiences was with, with a government contracting company that had 1,800 employees. And I used to go into the Pentagon and, and work with the DOD. And you're talking about the biggest organization in the United States, pretty much the U.S. government. And I tell you, the amount of things that I learned from that it was incredible. And I never want to do it again. <laughs> I have also worked in government briefly. And uh, maybe that, maybe there's some uh, correlation there that if you work in government for enough, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll end up far on the other side. Yeah, I know a few people have worked in government. 
So are there any other things that we didn't ask? Maybe because we, you know, we're, we're just getting started or things like that. Uh, let's see. I have a, th- I, one of the things that often people ask about is like, do I need to put a lot of money in to start the company? Do I need to have, you know, all this cat, do I need to have capital on hand to make the business run and things like that? And the short answer is if you're a builder of things, then you have a distinct advantage because you can build those things and basically the capital you're putting in is your effort. If you're not a creator of things, you have a much harder time at this point because you have to go find the people that can create. So I think all of the software developers out there, when you're you're looking at, you know, what are your advantages? Why are you well suited to create a, a business? Keep that in mind. I mean, you have these skills that are in demand and more importantly, you have this knowledge inside of you how to create things. Be a builder and you will find that you can learn a lot of the other things and you can do it with a limited amount of capital. And capital is a big piece of starting a business in many cases. So you, so I think developers have a huge potential advantage if we can get past the fact that building a business also involves dealing with other people. We have to be willing to go out there and deal with other people and communicate and sell and you know, build relationships as part of the, the process of building the business as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. Although I would also add that a little bit of capital, if you can bring it in, is like especially if you can bring it in yourself, certainly makes things a lot easier. You know, I'm not even talking, I'm talking about very small sums of money. Maybe, you know, if you have $10,000 that you can put into that company bank account on the first day, there's a, that you'll stress a lot less in those very early months than if that, you know, bank account balance is starting at absolute zero. But, it, you know, it, that's much, much lower than it would, you know, it would need to be for uh, many other types of businesses. And I think what Anthony hit the nail on the head, where if, if you have the ability to create the software yourself, that's going to be a huge advantage. If you don't have the ability to create the software yourself, you should probably learn to a certain extent uh, how to create software, not necessarily production grade software, but at least some prototypes that you can code together, you know, build a blog in 15 minutes, Rails type stuff. Uh, and use that for testing out your ideas. Yeah, one other thing I want to bring up as well is that if you're just getting started in building a business, there's a lot of, especially right now, there's a lot of places that you can go, communities that you can join, where you can learn about a lot of these things in the early stages of your business from people that have already done it. There's the, the term masterminds, which is sort of going around right now and is gaining popularity, is is a good one to to understand. A mastermind is a group of, of maybe three, four, five, six other people that are at where you're at or a little bit further along, so you know slightly different levels, but where you can meet with them once every two weeks and talk through the challenges that you're experiencing and set goals that they can hold you accountable for. So I highly recommend that if you're getting started building a business or thinking about it, look for the communities out there. Try to find a mastermind group that's maybe local or, or maybe online. It doesn't really matter join that group and and sort of have them push you a bit because being pushed by the people around you is a good way to get your butt in gear and to actually deliver. Yep. Uh, and we've definitely made use of that sort of approach at Code Climate, uh, definitely informally. Oh, uh, there is one uh, another thing that I think would be interesting to talk about uh, a little bit for people thinking of starting their own business, which is that when you get started, there's going to be a ton of things that you are going to feel like you need to, you might feel like you need to do like setting up a bank account and creating an LLC and designing a nice logo and all that stuff. And really none of that matters. All that really matters is whether you can get customers to buy your product. Everything else is very solvable down the road. So I, you know, I went back and I made a list of this at one point, like all of these things that we did not do when I started Code Climate that I probably should have done. And, you know, in some cases they came back to bite us, in other cases not. But it didn't really matter because I knew that if I couldn't get the product to be successful where people would buy it, then the fact that I never properly filled out, you know, paperwork to register, you know, an LLC in Delaware or whatever was never going to matter. So, you know, I'll tell you, in many ca- in, in multiple cases, there were, uh, it went so far as us getting fined by governments. <laughs> like, you know, it was like, I can either deal with this paperwork or I can get fined later. I'm just gonna, like, how much will the fine be? Okay, whatever. I don't care. I'll deal with this later because my focus right now is entirely on 
building a product that's going to resonate with customers. And then you just, you know, the, the business worked and we paid the fine and we're done. So, <laughs> you know, it's interesting how much you can delay um, if the business is on the right footing. I feel smarter now. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. It means we did something right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do the picks. Curtis, you want to start us with picks? Sure. I might as well talk at some point during the show, right? Today, I'm going to be a little self-serving, and I'm going to pick two things that I recently wrote. First is a pricing series I wrote, which is about 7,000 words on pricing your services for freelancers. And the second post that I just did today, uh, so we a week old when, we, when the show comes out, is about five tips for the overworked consultant. Awesome. Ruben, what are your picks? Okay, so I have two types of picks tonight, today. I have, first of all, um, I've mentioned before, uh, one of my favorite blogs is Political Wire, which uh, follows what's going on in U.S. politics. And they have a podcast that I've also mentioned called Political Wire Conversations, where they talk with political consultants. And they had a great interview about a week or two ago, I guess, at the beginning of March, uh, with someone named Sasha Eisenberg. And he came out with this book, I think, called The Victory Lab, or Inside the Victory Lab. I've read the, all about what his findings were. And basically, it's the science of how you can win political races. And basically, it was this very long, fascinating interview about how the Obama team, he claims, won the election because they did tons and tons of A-B testing. And I thought that it's especially appropriate for people like us who are doing online businesses and services and trying to test them. And he said there there was even uh, in the Obama uh, campaign in 2012, there was a director of experiments. And that person's full-time job was come up with new A-B tests and just do them all the time. So I strongly recommend that uh, that everyone try that. And the second thing is, as I'm sure you've all heard, the Cosmos TV show for 2014 is out. Uh, I remember very, very clearly watching it because I was around then, in 1980 when the original Cosmos came out. And while I don't think that Neil deGrasse Tyson is quite up to the level of Carl Sagan in terms of uh, poetic text, uh, and only one episode has come out so far, I've been super impressed. So I'm picking the, the new Cosmos, and also, for those of you who like uh, more poetic science and beautiful writing and pictures, if a little dated, then both the original Cosmos book by Carl Sagan, which is great stuff, and then he came out with a sequel to that called Pale Blue Dot, which starts with a picture of the Earth from, I think it's Voyager 1 from Beyond Jupiter. And sure enough, the Earth looks like a pale blue dot, hence the name. And uh, great, great books, great writing, lots of fun stuff. Anyway, that's it for this week. All right, Eric, what are your picks? All right, so one pick is kind of relevant for this topic. It's at Business of Software 2012, Gail Goodman gave a talk. It's called The Long, Slow SaaS Ramp of Death. And she's the CEO of Constant Contact, and it basically goes through their entire company history. I think they started in like 99 and has like revenue numbers. And it basically tells, you know, how long and how hard and how much work it takes to get a SaaS to start growing. You know, that's not like an overnight thing, which is pretty relevant to the stories here. You know, two or three years to kind of get where you can take a salary out of it. Interesting. I guess I'll go next. I've been reading a couple of books. I don't remember which book this came out of, but it seemed to come out that uh, some people who are successful block out their time, you know, so that in a given week or in a given day, they'll spend so much time getting certain things done. And basically, I, I've kind of been approaching that and I found some calendar apps that I'm really, really liking. The first one is called Fantastical. It, th these are both Mac only or Mac and iOS. But uh, Fantastical basically allows me, the thing I'm using it for is it gives you a quick view of what's going on for the day. And then the other thing that it does, it allows you to type in when you want a new uh, event to show up in your calendar. And so I can type in, basically, meet Reuven for lunch on Thursday at 11 a.m. at McDonald's. And it will fill in all the right fields on the event so that it'll actually line everything up. And that way I don't have to go in and click the field and click the calendar and click, you know, whatever. It just knows that Thursday is is March the 13th, and it knows that, um, you know, at McDonald's is something that it puts into the, the where at, and I, I really like it. The other one that I'm using, I've been using Google Calendar for a long time, but I don't love the view mainly because it's a little bit ugly and it's not very customizable. Um, you can do some things with it. There are plugins that you can use for it, but I picked up an app called BusyCal, and it actually allows me to set the week. So I've got it set so that the week is eight days long. Um, and so basically it's from today till next Tuesday. We record this on Tuesdays. 
So uh, it shows me the entire week and then one more day. And it has all my to-dos on the side, which is also really nice, and just a bunch of stuff like that. And the view is pretty easy to read and, and see. So I'm really, really, really uh, happy with it. The other thing that it does is it puts the weather forecast at the top of each day. So I can look outside or I can look at the calendar and see that it's cloudy outside. Um, but, you know, the next few days are going to be sunny or, you know, uh, partly cloudy. And it, it's just nice. It's nice to have that there. So those are my picks. Brian, what are your picks? So I've got three picks today. The first is a blog post uh, that was written by my colleague, Michael Bernstein. It's called Sales for Engineers. And it's 50 points that he came up with targeted at how to help engineers think about engaging in sales. Um, because sales is something that I think for a lot of engineers is intimidating, not necessarily natural, maybe even so far as distasteful. But Michael has been interacting a lot with our customers and our prospective customers at Code Climate as of late. And some of the learnings that he had through that process, he's documented in this uh, post, which he just published. Uh, so that's my first one. Uh, my second pick is a book that I read recently called Secrets of Power Negotiating, 15th Anniversary Edition, Inside Secrets from a Master Negotiator by Roger Dawson which is a really silly sounding book with a really silly looking cover of like two people shaking hands on the cover. But it's actually a fantastic book. And it has very practical advice for how to interact in negotiating type contexts uh, in a way where you can both achieve your desired outcome and uh, do it in a way where both sides are feeling like they have had, you know, a successful negotiation. So if you ever feel like you have friction, for example, talking with a prospective customer about the price of your freelance services or your product, there's a lot of very practical tips that you can pick up very quickly from this book just by giving it a scan. Uh, it's an older book, but it's all very, very true to this day. And my third pick is DN Simple, uh, because Anthony is probably too humble to pick his own, uh, service. Uh, but we have used DN Simple from the beginning, uh, for Code Climate, uh, as well as I use it now for all my personal domains as well. We've just had a fantastic experience and basically no issues, uh, with managing all of our DNS and doing all of our domain name registration in there. Um, I think if I log in right now, I can still see the the first 30 names that Code Climate could have been called before Code Climate, where I registered domain names, which are now sitting there doing nothing. But uh, the, uh, the service, uh, you know, just works and um, has removed that from, you know, uh, a concern. And we, we never want to host that stuff ourselves. We want to leave it to experts like Anthony and his team. So we love their service and we highly recommend it. Awesome. Anthony, what are your picks? So I'm last up, huh? Okay, I'm gonna. I got one book and one podcast, uh, and then I, I will give you a little story. So the book is called "The Referral Engine: Teaching Your Business to Market Itself." Uh, and so essentially, I'm still in the process of reading this book, but it's pretty fantastic because it essentially it speaks a lot to the way that I want the our business to develop and grow. And I think that it's. it's important reading for anybody who is interested in using referrals as the mechanism for growing their business. So it, it's every time I read it, I, I did something with this book that I don't usually do, which is I've, I've highlighted quite a bit in this book using my Kindle. And that's, that's pretty rare. So it, it, it's really spoken to me. So that's the first one. The second one is a podcast. And since we're talking about business development and things like that, I want to point you all, if you haven't heard it, to the Tropical MBA. It's a fantastic podcast that's uh, released every week. So Dan and Ian, the guys who, who are essentially behind it, have a, a physical product business. And there's the listening to them and how they've developed their business and the stories behind it is incredible. They also they travel a lot. They're pushing sort of this nomadic lifestyle, and, and I just love that. So the Tropical MBA is a, is a really good thing to listen to, and, and I highly recommend taking a listen to that. Uh, and then, of course, since we're rubbing each other's backs here, patting each other, uh, we're big fans of Code Climate. Quick story. So C Code Climate, the, the beauty and pain of it is that it constantly nags you about how bad your code is, if your code's bad. And we recently started a new project internally 
And we set up code climate from day one. And the thing that's great about it is when you set it up early, it like it keeps you on your toes from early on so you don't get down this path of sort of dirty, messy code because you're seeing your code over time. And as soon as something starts to get bad, you go in and think, okay, well, how? what am I doing wrong here? How do I refactor this so that the, the code is going to be better? And to me, that has been extremely powerful. So we, we use it all the time. We have it hooked up to our hip chat. Uh, chat room and it, it's constantly telling us when we're doing things right and wrong and I think that's just awesome. So that's my third and final pick, obviously. Code Climate, good stuff. Uh, highly recommend it. Very nice. Alright, well uh, thanks for coming guys. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Alright, well I don't think we have any announcements this week so we'll wrap up and we'll talk to y'all later. 